Well, we're back. This was the uh, fourth time that I've watched this movie. And I think it was probably the most moving and powerful time that I watched it because you guys did the introduction and it gave me a little more insight, not only to the film, but you know, what you all accomplished. So good job, everybody. Well, we have some questions. Um, can, we, can we start our Q&A? Great. Um, question number one, have you held any additional performances since the one depicted in Capturing Grace? And if so, uh, how are they different? That's a great question. And the answer is yes, we have done two additional projects. Uh, we learned so much from the 2012 performance project, which was really our first foray into this kind of community performance project. And uh, we took all of that learning, all of the lessons that came out of that and came back two years later with another project that was also based on uh, a piece by Mark Morris called L'Allegro, Il Penseroso, Il Moderato, a long title. Um, and this was, we decided to focus on one piece, but really open up the possibilities for all kinds of levels of participation. So instead of having the default being sort of standing and locomoting, we had the default being seated. Everybody was seated. If people wanted to get up and move around the floor, they were welcome to do that. And David, I can't tell you how much anxiety that just lifted off of people's shoulders because they knew that whatever they were going to be feeling on the day of the performance, they were going to be able to participate in some way, um, which we, we, we could have adapted in 2012. Obviously, if someone came in and said, I'm just not comfortable moving today, we would have made it work. But with this, with this different model, it just opened up possibilities. And then we did a project um, two years ago that had uh, – we invited four – choreographers, actually three choreographers and an improv uh, facilitator to create four pieces. So um, that was, again, every project has been very different, but has been, uh, you know, enlightening and, and inspiring. Uh, I think the first one was particularly special, though. So I'm, I'm glad that Dave chose that one and captured it on, on film in, in such a beautiful way. Yeah. Kind of a related question was uh, other dance classes throughout the world, have they also done performances? Yes, there have been a number of performance projects with uh, affiliates in, in the Dance for PD network. And we've learned from that too. We have regular exchanges with other communities and other teaching artists. And so we, you know, we ask them, what did you do? Can we see a video? We'd love to learn what worked and what was, what was challenging. Uh, some, a lot of, those performances have actually been site specific. So they've taken place in outdoors and parks, or they've taken place in art museums. Uh, one of my colleagues, Misty Owens, did a project at the Dallas Museum of Art. Uh, so there's there there been a lot of creative uses of space, which I love because I think one of the things I, I hope came out of this film is just the the rich artistic experience that our participants had going through this this project and th for me the more the more creative inputs you can have whether that's music uh, visual art being surrounded by a, a garden you know these are all things that that help support our our movement and help support our sense of uh, of expression so i'm i'm fully in favor of anything that that is going to to create more uh, more inspiration and, and allow people to uh, to explore their, their inner creativity as much as possible. Yeah, nice. Um, this is for Dave. Uh, do you find making films like Capturing Grace and My Father, My Brother and Me are easier or harder because of your diagnosis? Mm, gosh, really interesting question. One I've never been asked. Um, you know, they were such, they were really different films when, um, you know, when you're, a, when you're a, a, a journalist, you're sort of, it's sort of an occupational hazard, but you tend to look at the world through stories, you know, what would make a good story. And after my Parkinson's diagnosis, and as I was thinking about the fact that my dad had Parkinson's, my older brother had Parkinson's, I had Parkinson's, it just felt to me like there was a story in that uh, to be told. And and so that was the genesis of that film, to use that personal family 
experience as a way to look into the world of Parkinson's, the, the experience of it, the latest research, the quest uh, for a cure, the progress that was being made. Um, and, and for capturing grace, um, you know, that, that more probably more than anything I've ever done in my life, um, it was something that I just felt I had to do, you know, that there wasn't uh, even a choice about it, that it just, it was a story that just had to be done. So in that sense, it was easier because there was just no question in my mind that it, that it was something that, that needed to be done. Um, and I felt driven by that. And I was also blessed with extraordinary colleagues working on it, not only David and his team at Mark Morris, but a wonderful cinematographer, Eddie Meritz, wonderful sound recordist, Peter Ginsberg, wonderful editor, Gail Huddleston, my colleagues at Kip Kickham Media. Um, and so the collective joy of that uh, also made that project uh, such a great um, experience. Um, I just was really lucky, you know, it was, um, it was the best and it was the last film that I made. Um, and I was happy about that too, you know, I don't have any desire to, to make another film. I still write, I still do other things, but um, yeah, it was just, it was, it was a, a great, a great gift. Um, and in that sense, um, I guess it was, I guess it was the easiest. Yeah. Nice. And, and can I add uh, one thing to that though? I, I think Dave, Dave is, is, what I noticed is that in terms of your interactions and relationships with members of our group, I think there was, there was a special connection that you had with them. Not, not, not just because of who you are as a, as a person with the the biggest heart that I that I've ever met, but um, but also I think they I think there was an element of trust and under mutual understanding because you were you were living with Parkinson's and they were living with Parkinson's, and I think that opened doors to uh, incredibly candid interviews that may not have been possible if if you were you know more of a kind of outsider coming into that community. So I'll just add that I, I think it did. If, if anything, it, it helped provide that kind of access. Yeah, so thank you so much for adding that, David, because it is totally true. You know, when you're a journalist, I I'm, was very much an old school journalist and you do not take sides. You know, you do not um, become friends with the people that you are interviewing or reporting on. Your job is to tell that story as well as you can with fairness and accuracy and truth. Um, but I will say, as David says, in this film, I didn't care <laughs> yeah, if, if I became uh, friends with the people uh, that you just all watched. They were extraordinary. They were just extraordinary. And um, the chance to form those human bonds was again, an incredible gift. And um, I wouldn't trade that. And David is absolutely right. That was profoundly different, profoundly different than anything I had ever experienced. Mm. Yeah. Um, one of the questions was uh, during the filming and production, were there any artistic differences between you two? You seem like great companions, great friends but it's a project. David, go ahead. Well, I think in this way, Dave was, uh, was old fashioned enough to, to make sure that the journalism wasn't influencing the art making. Um, I, I will remember though, one thing he said to me early on, uh, because in any kind of artistic process, there's also politics that goes on. There are people who are want to make sure their voices are heard, and there are people who uh, want to make sure that a specific history is told, and 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 all of this. And you know, Dave had a very specific vision for what this film was, um, and uh, we respected from the beginning that that his vision was it was his film. You know, and and he said to me, I just I want to make one thing really. I want us to understand one thing here, 
that this this film is about this group, but it's not for this group, right? It's not. Um, Dave was not making the film for them, for a particular, uh, you know, for a particular agenda that, that anyone in the group had. It was really a film that tried to tell stories that would resonate beyond the group and would, would serve as models for, uh, for overcoming challenges. Uh, but in creating the trajectory of the film, I think it was really important for us not to think of it as a promotional opportunity or for anyone in the group to think of it as a promotional opportunity, but to step back and let Dave tell his story and let us focus on the art making. And, and we did. And once, I think once we had that settled, uh, it was, it was a, a very collaborative and mutually respectful process. It was mutually respectful from the beginning, but it, it, it was just helpful to have that clarity because I think a lot of people when they say, oh, there's a camera here. So this is, this is the story that needs to be told. And we let Dave decide what stories would be told. In fact, there were things that happened in the film that I didn't see until the premiere. I didn't even know they happened. The rehearsal that happened uh, out of the studio in Eileen's house. I didn't even know that happened. I had no idea. I had no idea he'd gone around and interviewed people asking them about the letters that I'd written to them before the curtain went up. So, you know, all of that was a surprise. And, and I think what, what made it possible was the immense trust that Dave had fostered uh, between us personally, but also uh, among everybody uh, in the production. And because of that trust, we let him do what he does best. Just a, a personal question, actually, when I think of grace, I think of kind of two different definitions. One is elegance and the other is mercy. Is there a play on that somehow? How did you come up with capturing grace? Yeah, thank you, David. That's, I've been asked that before. Um, and I, I, guess, I guess what I'd say is the title kind of came to me, occurred to me, I think before I even understood it. I I liked how it sounded. I liked the words. I liked the sense and feel of that, of, of capturing grace. Um, and I understand it, I think, over time in a, in a different way in that, um, that the people who are part of that film, David and the dancers, to me personified uh, grace, the grace that comes through resilience and through trust and through community and through being there for each other. Uh, so yes, both elegance and mercy, both expression and communion. And, um, and they captured that um, and um, provided that, a definition of that in a way that I had never, ever seen. And so in a sense, I think uh, the title became true after I thought of it in a way that I hadn't previously understood. Uh, a question for both of you. I don't know, maybe David, you're not so able to answer this because you still have relationships probably. Is there a particular participant from the documentary that made the largest impact on you? Maybe I'll, Dave, you want to you want to answer that one first, and then I'll. Sure. I mean, it was just um, they're just some of the most extraordinary people I've I've ever met in my life, and they all shined. One of the things I thought about David when one of my favorite scenes in the film is the improvisational dance that happened um, a night or two before the performance. There are moments in that dance where there are people who aren't sort of central figures in the film, like Reggie and Bobby or, or, or Joy or, or Cindy. There are people who you, or Charlie, there are people who you see only for a moment, but they have a moment. Um, uh, Leonore has a moment in that dance. There, there are a number of people who just 
shined forth. So all of them affected me. Um, you know, Reggie and Bobby Butts uh, had a, a profound impact, I think, on everyone around them. Um, you know, during that project and continue to, to this day, watching them again today, watching them do that little improvisational dance they did in the studio where they're listening, dancing to that song, you know, September and, and um, you know, at the end of that song, um, the music cut out. My, my cinematographer, Eddie Maris, was just playing that song back on his iPad and the music cut out. And Bobby, who has this transcendent voice, just started singing and finished out the, the refrain, these precious days I'll spend with you. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did. That's what those two did. They spent those precious days with each other to the end. Um, and that was deeply moving, um, as, as were they all. I was particularly, I, all the stories you're touching, and for me, as, a, as someone who knew them primarily before this film as a, as a teacher, I, I knew them coming into the studio once or twice a week to take class. Uh, they they were icebergs to me. I, I knew the tip of the iceberg, but I didn't know what was what was beneath the surface. And to be able to see their stories and hear hear from them what the program meant to them, what their lives were like, I often go back to Cindy's story and and the wonderful scene that was captured in her home, in her living room. Because for me, it speaks to what happens when people living with Parkinson's think like a dancer, right? We're, we're not asking or expecting an overnight transformation that people are going to suddenly be able to do everything that is given to them in, in class or in a performance project, but it's about the mindset. What does it mean to think like a dancer? What does it mean to treat your body like a dancer or to think about movement or music as a dancer does? And for Cindy, this incredible awakening of herself, of her body, of her spirit, when she starts to dance and the transformation that you see in her living room from being being off and having difficulty initiating movement into a state of flow. That has been deeply inspiring for me because I know not everybody on the uh, in the, the webinar today is going to go out and suddenly take a dance class, but everybody has the ability to say, take some element of thinking like a dancer, whether that's using music in your daily life, whether that's thinking more choreographically about things in your life that are a bit difficult to navigate, whether it's thinking about projecting your movement the way a performer does, there's some element that we can all take into ourselves. And at the very minimum, a sense of self-confidence and self-respect in our bodies that Cindy talks about. You know, I'm, I'm a dancer, so I have to sit up straight. Like it's, you know, it's about, it's about mind over matter. And, and I love that. I was so inspired by that because often, again, I, I'm seeing people in the studio. I don't know how they're thinking about the experience at home. And so that was really powerful for me. And, you know, as you've sometimes observed, David, um, and John Hagenbotham says this in the film too, Dancers are dancers, you know. Um, when when uh, Marsha Abrams says at one point, I don't want to look stupid, I don't want to fall. And you said, you know, all dancers feel like that. And when John talks about how he goes into a rehearsal with his own celebrated company and he goes into a dance for PD rehearsal, and it's there's just not that much difference in terms of what people are wanting to try to do and accomplish with their bodies. Yeah. Um, we've had a dance for Parkinson's class at the Pittsburgh Ballet for many years. Um, and when we talk to folks often about, you know, joining in, there's some reservation and the idea is, you know, I'm not a dancer. How do you answer those questions? Well, everyone is a dancer. Everyone's born a dancer. We almost all of us dance at some time uh, as, as children. And then somewhere along the line, someone tells us it's not okay because of, you know, our personality or because of our gender or because of our background or whatever it is, because we have to be 
we have to suddenly become very serious adults. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, dance has been a part of human cultures around the world for thousands of years. And it is an essential part of what it means to be human. Uh, so we all have a right uh, to, to engage in this, this wonderful form of movement uh, that is, it, it is ungendered, it is unrelated to, to background, it is simply what it means to be human. Uh, what I tell people who are ambivalent about it is that uh, it, it encourage them to drop their expectations of what they think a dance class is, because this is a very different kind of dance class. It's actually a very uh, integrative class in that we take many different styles. One of the questions in chat was about music. Uh, and I know in the performance, we're mostly bringing in classical music, but the class itself uses rock and roll, jazz, blues, uh, country, some classical, uh, traditional music from around the world. So it's a really diverse set of, of musical sources and also a really diverse set of, of dance styles. So yes, we do some partner dance. We do swing and salsa. Uh, we do tap and modern dance. So it's, it's really a mix of things that we think are gonna be helpful for people. So I say, try it once. And usually when people come one time, they're, they're, they're actually hooked because it is, it, it's not just about the movement. There's a social factor. There's, uh, it's lovely to come and, and have, be surrounded by music, kind of a, a, an immersive musical experience. Um, and you, you form these incredible connections with, with the other people in the class. Uh, so usually once I, I do a little bit of that kind of arm twisting, people are, are willing to try it. Um, and, and then of course, if, if that fails, I go into the 42 published peer reviewed studies on the benefits of dance on people with Parkinson's and the fact that uh, many of the leading neurologists in the US and around the world actually recommend dance programs for people with Parkinson's now. In fact, the, the woman at the end there uh, who's talking to Manny, Dr. Claire Henchcliffe uh, is, is a huge proponent of our program, ran the uh, Movement Disorders Center at Weill Cornell Medical Center in New York, has recently moved to California. But uh, she, you know, she, she's one of the leading neurologists in New York and, and for years has recommended uh, that people take dance because her patients came and told her about it and then she came to class to see for herself. So I always, I, I try to leave the, the medical reference and, and so that's like a last resort, but I do, I do bring it in there because there's, there's a lot of good evidence now on, uh, on significant motor and non-motor benefits for people with Parkinson's who dance. Right. Um, there have been a number of articles uh, published about uh, the relationship between Parkinson's disease and probably the medication and folks experiencing an increase in creativity. Dave, have, have you noticed any such change or, you know, addition? It's something people, I think, and probably many people on this on this Zoom uh, call today uh, can, could speak to too. I think it's something that's commonly talked about uh, with my friends who have Parkinson's uh, during my time on the Michael J. Fox Foundation's Patient Council. It's a topic that would come up about the sense of sort of doors opening and, mm. and, um, and, and creativity happening. You know, I think, well, I have two thoughts about this. One is that it's not gonna be true necessarily for everyone. And we should always remember that Parkinson's is such an intensely varied and idiosyncratic condition. And the challenges that people face very wild, wildly and they can be gargantuan. And so if you aren't experiencing a burst of creativity or thinking, what are you talking about? This is the worst. Um, that's that's real too, and we should we should never sort of say it's all about attitude necessarily. But I will say that for me, I, that I don't think it's accidental mm -hmm. uh, that the two most profound professional experiences of my life took place after my Parkinson's uh, diagnosis, and that and that my whole sense of what matters in life, uh, what I feel, what I'm here to do um, changed. Um, 
And I don't think that's accidental, mm -hmm. um, but I also know it's very individual. You, you kind of suggested that you were not going to be making any more films. Is that completely off the table or could we maybe do a little arm twisting at some point? I mean, while the film was going on, we got so many comments that how, how inspirational and the kind of impact and, you know, we're always looking for cures, but you can't, you can't put the inspirational side of all this, you know, off either. So yeah, maybe we can twist an arm. You can come to Pittsburgh and we'll treat you to some stuff here. <laughs> well, I would love to, to I, I, part of my father, my brother and me was, was filmed in, in Pittsburgh um, with a couple of really great people at the, at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I, yeah, I, I think there is some, it's so important to tell these stories. Um, um, I think, and I, just a, a quick anecdote, but um, in Michael J. Fox's new um, memoir, he writes about how when he, when he had a bad fall and shattered his wrist, that it was a relief in some ways to have an x-ray that he could show to people and say, this is what happened to me mm -hmm. because there's no x-ray in Parkinson's, right? There's not, there's not an MRI, there's not a blood test, there's not a, a picture of it. You can't really show people what's broken inside. And Michael was saying that, you know, at least with my mangled wrist, I could show people exactly what happened. But I think what that also says is that's why it's so important to tell these stories. Yeah. Michael Fox is a wonderful writer and communicator in addition to being a spectacular human being and philanthropist. Um, but to tell these stories matters. To do what David does matters. To do what you're doing in Western Pennsylvania matters. These stories matter. They count because we all, just as David was saying about dance, that it's part of human experience. Stories are part of human experience and we need to tell them, we need to share them. We need to inspire each other yeah. because we need each other. That's what community, and Lord knows we've learned about it this past year. That's why community matters. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. Yeah, thank you. Any, any final thoughts? We don't wanna keep you guys way past the deadline. We said three in except for a couple hiccups that we had. Um, I think we want to thank you. And But any uh, ideas or thoughts that you would like to send out to our folks out this way? David? Well, Dave, I'm still resonating with the incredibly inspiring words you just shared, this idea of community. And I think for, for many of us, you know, the the arts are an incredible way of cultivating community um, and connection and trust, but but many activities do that. And I think the, the key now is finding uh, the thing that you love to do, the thing that will um, you know lift you out of bed in the morning and say, I, I have to I have to do that today. Uh, for a lot of folks in the film, that is dance and music. For some folks, it's tai chi. For others, it's boxing. But whatever it is, finding that thing that that really fills your heart and your soul um, and, and builds a community for you because right now, more than ever, we need those communities. Yeah. Those communities can happen online. I, I've seen it happen in our, our classes. We, we are building it's those communities. Right it's happening right now. It's happening right now. Absolutely. So um, I think the key is, is really being open to that and understanding um, just how important community and social interaction is to living well with with Parkinson's right so it's 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 such a critical piece that I think is is often neglected um, from the medical side and and we we need to emphasize and as you see in in the the dance program it is a huge part of what we do and a very important part of of what dance can offer and I would only add just one more thought to that, that ties in with that, I believe, which is that it is through those experiences, through doing what brings you joy, um, that you experience um, community. 
And I think it also then opens the door to gratitude. Um, and, and so I will offer one last quote also from Michael uh, J. Fox, which is that he says that, that gratitude is what makes optimism sustainable. Um, because when you are grateful for the opportunities you're given and can find a way to share those with others and be with others, um, that that makes taking the next step and the next day and staying open to those possibilities uh, possible. And so I think whatever we can do uh, to come together uh, opens the door to gratitude and opens the door for that experience of community to continue. Yeah, and I, I would just add that I don't have Parkinson's disease, but after 16 plus years working with the community here, that it can be so isolating, not only for the individual, but for the entire family. Um, and my heart goes out to those folks that are isolated because the Parkinson's community is so supportive and encouraging and inspiring. And if, if folks on today, if you know someone that's not involved with the community that Dave and David are talking about, please encourage them to, to join in. And, and what I found is, I mean, look, we have these celebrities, for lack of a better word, joining in and there's no reason except for they are a part of a bigger community. Um, so thank you both. Thank you guys. This has been one of the highlights of my years and years here with the foundation. I, I can't thank you enough. And I'm sure the folks on today are equally inspired and grateful for your joining us. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank, thank you, David and the whole crew at the foundation, thank you so much for having us. It's been really a, a pleasure and an honor to, to spend the afternoon with you. So well, thank, thank you. you both so much and no more emails from me. So <laughs> <Indeed>. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen. We'll see you.